everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we want to welcome you to our School Nurse Leadership uh, webinar, Staff in School Wellness. Um, we really appreciate you taking some time out of your day today to learn a little bit more about how to um, help encourage and um, address staff and school wellness. Um, so we're really excited you could all join us and hope you enjoy this webinar. Uh, my name is Christy Cox and I'm the Training and Program Manager here at Healthy Schools Campaign. And um, Healthy Schools Campaign is the organization that's hosting today's webinar. We'll tell you a little bit more about Healthy Schools Campaign in a couple minutes, but first I wanted to quickly review some of the basics for today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is going to run for about one hour, and um, we will have a recording of the webinar available to everyone to, re to view. Um, we'll make that available in about one week. So um, if you've registered for the webinar, or if you have friends who wanted to participate in the webinar but weren't able to make it, We'll send along a link to the recorded version, and then you're welcome to share that with any friends. Um, so, and we'll also post that on our website so that you could access that uh, easily that way as well. Um, also, at the end of the webinar, if you could take a minute to complete a quick survey about the webinar, we'd really appreciate it. We um, love to hear feedback from everyone. So again, we'll run for about an hour, we'll have a recording, and then at the end we'll ask you to complete a survey and that will wrap up the webinar. Um, at the end of the webinar, we're going to uh, hold back about 15 minutes for question and answers. If you look at the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a chat box, and that's where we want you to type in questions um, uh, on the control panel. Um, and then you can just send it to us. And what we'll do is we'll address all the questions at the end. So feel free throughout the webinar to chat in any questions you might have. We're going to um, jot those questions down and then answer them at the end of the presentation. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers today. Uh, we have Alex Mays from the Healthy Schools Campaign. Uh, Sandra Lollinger from um, Community Consolidated School District Number 89 in Glen Ellen, Illinois. She is a um, she's one of last year's School Nurse Leadership Award winners. And then we have Carla Smith from Ellis School in Fremont, New Hampshire. She's also a winner from last year. We're really excited to have everyone joining us today. Um, again, really wonderful topic. They've got great information to share, and um, so uh, we're uh, again excited to have everyone join us. We want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Of um, We have MAKO and School Health who are both sponsoring the webinar and the School Nurse Leadership Award. Um, we're, uh, we kicked the award, off, the award season off yesterday. Um, those applications are available online on our website. And we will um, share additional information in regards to the School Nurse Leadership Award at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the torch over to Alex, and she's going to get us started on today's webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Christy, um, and welcome, everybody. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us on today's webinar. My name is Alex Mays, and I am the National Program Director for Healthy Schools Campaign. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes to provide you with an overview of our organization and Healthy Schools Campaign's work around um, school nurse leadership before we get to our main event of Sandy and Carla, um, who I know everybody is excited to hear from. Um, next slide, Christy. Um, so just a little bit about Healthy Schools Campaign. Um, we are a not-for-profit organization based in Chicago that works at the local, state, and national levels to promote healthy schools and healthy students. We believe in the simple and very common sense notion that healthy students are better learners and that health and wellness should be incorporated into every aspect of the school experience. Um, our work in Chicago really focuses on training school stakeholders, so parents, teachers, principals, and school nurses to be champions for change um, in their school health and wellness environment. And then we try to build on those changes and lessons learned from the work those stakeholders are leading district, state, and federal policies that create healthier school environments for kids across the country. Next slide. Um, and so our program, a key component of our program and our work um, at Healthy Schools Campaign is our school nurse leadership program. We really see access to school health services as a key component of a healthy school environment 
and we want to do everything that we can to increase access to school nurses and school health services. Um, previously, Healthy Schools Campaign ran a school nurse leadership program. Um, Sandy, who will be speaking, was actually a graduate of that program. Um, and through the program, we trained over 300 school nurses, primarily in Illinois, but also uh, in Colorado, in Kentucky, and New York. Um, unfortunately, we, we no longer run the program um, due to some funding issues. Um, but through that program, we really just came to see the incredible impact that school nurses have on student health and wellness. I really um, wanted to champion um, more access to school nurses and help others understand that key role that school nurses can play um, in creating healthy school environments. Um, so while we no longer run the training program, we do now have, do a lot of work around advocacy for increased access to school nurses and school health services, um, advocating for changes at this local, state, and federal levels to um, support access to school nurses. So for example, a key issue that we worked on recently um, is one called the free care policy. Um, this was a barrier that prevented school districts from billing Medicaid for the health services that were delivered by school health providers, including school nurses. So we really saw it as a tremendous barrier to in accessing resources for the services that school nurses were providing. Um, we advocated for almost a decade um, to get that policy changed and were successful about a year ago in having that policy re um, reversed and now school districts um, are able to bill for those services that school nurses are providing um, to Medicaid enrollees. Um, there's some work that still needs to be done on implementation at the state level but um, a very exciting opportunity for um, increasing access to school nurses and, the res and resources for their work. Um, we also have a very robust communications program around our school nursing work. We do a regular school nurse newsletter, which I have a link to sign up to shortly. Um, we post regular blogs about the wonderful work that school nurses are leading and then host webinars such as today's highlighting school nurse leaders from across the country. Next slide. Um, and so another key component of our School Nurse Leadership Program is our School Nurse Leadership Award, which Christy referenced. Um, both Sandy and Carla are past winners of the award, um, and it has really given us the opportunity just to recognize incredible work that school nurses are leading across the country. Um, this will be the third year that we've been doing it, um, and we have 50 plus applications each year. Um, with school nurses applying from across the country, um, we have even had applicants from um, abroad from Department of Defense schools in Japan and elsewhere, um, which has been very exciting to see. And the Leadership Award really um, looks to recognize school nurses that are exemplifying these qualities of embracing evidence-based practice, demonstrating the ability to work with and lead groups, supporting policy changes, and building teams to make changes related to school health. Um, so those are the criteria that we really look to use to evaluate the applicants um, and recognize great work that is taking place. Next slide. Um, and so as Christy mentioned, uh, we just launched the 2016 award, which we're very excited about. Um, we launched it yesterday. There's a link shortly to download the application, but we would encourage you, um, if you are a school nurse, to apply. If you know of a school nurse to apply on their behalf, you are welcome to apply, apply on the behalf of somebody else. Um, the applications are due March 8th, and we'll select up to five winners. And each winner receives a $500 gift card to School Health, um, and in addition to recognition on our blogs and through webinars, um, and just trying, you know, again, promoting that wonderful work that school nurses are doing. So we would certainly encourage you to apply. Next slide. Um, and here is the link to download the 2016 application. Um, in addition to a link to sign up to, for Healthy Schools Campaign's uh, school nurse newsletter in case that is something that interests you. Um, so I will pass it back over to Christy, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Alex. Lots of great information. Um, for those of you who weren't able to jot down all that information when we had that screen up, we'll offer it again um, at the end of the webinar. Um, and then also, if you go to our website, healthyschoolscampaign.org, and find the School Nurse Leadership page, all of that information is provided there as well. Okay, so I'm now going to officially hand it over to 
Sandy Lawinger. She's from the Community Consolidated School District number 89, which is in Glen Ellen, Illinois. And she's going to share some of her um, findings around staff wellness. Go ahead, Sandra. Hello, my name is Sandy Lawinger, and I'm, I'm very honored to be here today as part of Healthy Schools Campaign Leadership Webinar um, and to share a couple of um, opportunities and activities we've done in our school district. Um, next slide, please. Um, as, as she said, I'm in uh, Glen Ellen, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Um, so it's a suburban school, about 2,000 students in our district, um, and we're preschool through eighth grade. Next slide. So I've been a nurse for about 30 years now, um, and 16 years I've been a district nurse, so a school nurse in um, Glen Ellen. Um, my previous experience was in critical care. Um, my master's was in uh, clinical nurse specialist in critical care. So just another example of how we can take our nursing degree and do lots of different things and different opportunities as we grow in our skills. So I've been here um, for 16 years, and there are five schools in our district. I'm lucky with the fact that we have a full-time RN in each one of our five buildings, but I'm the only certified school nurse in our district. Um, so take care of um, all of those issues related to specifically our students with special education needs. Um, I'm also part of our Illinois Association of School Nurses. I'm the past president for our division, the, the um, local area that, we, um, that I'm in. But then I also currently am the Legislative Affairs Chair um, at the state level for IASN. I partner with Loyola University to provide an instructor. Uh, I'm an instructor in the School Emergency Care course. We teach over the summer for school nurses across the state. And then I'm on the board of a local Glen Ellen Youth and Family Counseling Services here in, in my city. Next slide, please. The committee work that I've been involved in has really been around uh, policy work and um, you know, general services for our students related to health. But as I'll discuss in a minute, one of the other components that I feel has been really important is my work with employee wellness also. So I chair our employee wellness committee. And then I also chair our district health advisory council, where we look at our local school wellness policy and our food allergy management and program policy. I sit in our crisis management committee with all of the building administrators. And then I also partner with our local community college, the College of DuPage, to be able to provide um, community nursing um, practicums for the nursing students at the local college. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I did when I first started in my role as a school nurse, since it wasn't an area that was as familiar to me, is I wanted to evaluate what our current programs were related to health in the, um, in the school district. And as you know, there are many, many places, many components to health if you look across the whole school. Um, this diagram shows the whole school, whole community, whole child um, diagram from the CDC and the ASCD. When I first did my um, evaluation, I used the school health index, which was what the CDC had out at that time, which was years ago now. Now they've combined, but the components are the same. When you're looking at what health education we're doing, nutrition services, the health services in the health office, um, as Healthy Schools also works on looking at the physical environment, environmental health. But the other components that I found that we really weren't doing much with at all were related to employee wellness and then also to the social emotional components, um, the social emotional climate. So I you know, wanted to spend some more time looking at that piece um, to see how we can make a difference there. Next slide, please. So we put together an employee wellness committee. Luckily, my superintendent is very um, supportive of us you know, doing anything that would be proactive to, to help out the culture of the, the school district. And so I got together membership across the district. It was voluntary. Um, and, but I was, felt it was very important to have every level of practice represented. So I wanted to have our instructional assistants, the aides in the classroom, the certified teachers, um, some of the administrators, and wanted representation from not only our central office, but all five of our buildings. Um, we've had this, the Employee Wellness Committee together for maybe about 10 years now. So we needed to then direct what we were going to do as a group. So as a part of our, um, our regular practice through our employee benefits, we have the opportunity to, to participate in a wellness screen where you have a blood draw and get some lab values back, but then also complete a survey about yourself, about your nutrition, about your physical activity, about how you're feeling social-emotionally. 
So we would take that aggregate data from all of the employees across the district and then from that make our kind of directives for the employee wellness group. We also did an employee survey to just ask people what they'd like that they don't have currently in the district. And from that, I, I, there's a, a website if you're interested in um, kind of really getting a manual on how to do this in your own district. It's called this um, School Employee Wellness, is, would be what you'd look up on a website. And it's from the Directors of Health Promotion and Education. So I use some of their resources also. Next slide. So we found in our district that the top four risk factors were life satisfaction, weight management, poor perceived health, and stress. So from that, we developed a mission statement that's listed there that we really wanted to put something together to help people develop healthy lifestyles, habits, make good choices that contribute to their positive well-being. So we wanted to put activities together that would support these four top risk factors. Next slide, please. So we put some different um, activities in place for um, all of the district employees. We wanted to continue on um, health promotion, so um, brought in um, a group to do flu shots and the wellness screens. We had a Biggest Loser competition, and then we kind of morphed that into also having a fitness competition where people were actually rewarded for how many steps and how much activity they were doing. Did some, put some sports activities together. Healthy vending as opposed to some of the non-healthy vending that's available. And then also wanted to be active in the community, so participated in Make-A-Wish and blood drives, put some exercise classes in place. But then also we were finding that we wanted to look at that whole climate, that social-emotional climate. So this year we did, um, we spent October where we all had times where we were focusing on pay it forward or doing random acts of kindness. In November we put out um, a bag in the teacher's lounge with everybody's name on the bag and people could stop by and write a note of thanks or appreciation to that employee, and then everyone took those home at Thanksgiving. And then in December, we did um, 21 days of gratitude journaling, which was an optional um, opportunity to write down three things you were grateful for every day, looking at the research to know that that would increase your sense of gratitude and satisfaction. Really looking at that work-life balance and the fact that um, you know, you may not, this may not be your dream job or you may not always find your dream job, but you can always be kind of trying to work within a dream company where you felt supported and opportunities to grow and where people really care. Next slide, Pete, please. So as a, as a state, in the state of Illinois and, and certainly in many areas across the United States where there's really more of a push on social emotional learning for our students, and the more we've talked about that in our district, the more we felt like our staff can't teach those skills to our students if the staff doesn't first have some of those skills. So these were some of the um, competencies that we really, as an employee wellness committee, also wanted to work toward with our staff so that they can model these behaviors and be supportive of our students. Next slide. So in talking to administration, we really felt that to to really develop these skills, we needed to have a professional development day that was specifically related to working on social emotional competencies. And um, our assistant superintendent for learning gave us um, a day that we could work on that with the staff, actually half a day. So the first, uh, first year that we did it, we brought in a keynote speaker, um, Alex Lickerman, who wrote the book The Undefeated Mind. And then this year we had a keynote that was Sean Aker, um, who has a TED Talk that's great if you ever want to look that up. Um, and he has a book called The Happiness Advantage. So we t started that as our, our foundation for the day, and then we did um, breakout sessions. Next slide, please. So we put together 12 different activities for the afternoon, and staff got to pick those activities based on what their interest was, what they'd like to participate in. Um, so we had cooking and uh, physical activities. We had someone come in and do meditation and teach them how to go through meditation, um, comedy, and then we also used our employee assistant program um, people to come in. I feel as if many of our staff members don't know what EAP is and how to access that, when to access them for their own personal lives. So we had um, two of the different EAP people come in, the employee assistance program people come in to do presentations. So our staff was familiar with them. We did coloring, people loved that. We brought in dog therapy. And then also, instead of the, um, the Biggest Loser, we did Weight Watchers at Work, trying to give a, a really um, you know, more credible uh, program for people to learn life skills as opposed to just competition for losing weight. 
we have been able to continue these activities with our staff after our, um, our um, professional development day also. Next slide, please. Oh, so, so anyway, to end that, um, that piece of it before I go into the, um, the food, um, the allergies, I really, the take home points is that we need to look at, look at what the biggest needs are with the employees and really realize that they, you know, the staff members are the models for our kids and that we need to address their needs too to make the whole environment for the students ultimately to be a positive experience. So one of the other things that I, I looked at um, was the food that we serve in schools. As I mentioned before, I'm on our, the committee, I chair the committee for um, the, the local wellness policy, but the local wellness policy, the policy really looks at nutrition education, nutrition guidelines for food served in schools, but it doesn't necessarily look at allergies. And we have in our school 7% um, of our students with a documented food allergy. I'm sure some of you have even more than that. But the, the concern that we have is that is when we're serving food to students when we don't have those parents present. So not what comes in for lunch, but when the food comes in and it's something that we're serving for parties that we have or celebrations that we have. We've eliminated many of the food things such as birthday party treats and things of that nature. But we really, I had a, a strong pushback from our parent-teacher organizations. They did not want to eliminate food for the holiday parties, they still wanted to have food for certain celebrations. So how do we do that in a safe way so that students aren't excluded? Next slide, please. So there's so much emotionality related to food, um, and I didn't want the decision to be mine or the nurses. We really wanted it to be collaborative. So what I was able to do was to put together a committee of parents that had very strong views on all sides of that issue, parents that didn't want me to get rid of food because that's taking all the fun away from school, and parents that had children with these anaphylactic reactions that were worried for their children's safety. So I brought all of those people together, and we have this committee. Um, again, I wanted all buildings to be represented. I had parents of allergic and non-allergic children. And we put together a list of safe options for kids at school. Specifically, we chose peanut and tree nut free foods because as you all know, you can't eliminate foods with all of the allergens that our kids report that they have an allergy to. So we wanted to pick those since they're the most, uh, cause the most causes of um, anaphylactic reaction. Um, so we put together this list of safe foods for not, um, so that these kids would be able to participate and there'd be um, safe options for them. I also put the link there that snacksafely.com. We often use them as a good resource for um, peanut, tree nut, and then also manufactured in a facility with um, language too. So we, then we went and we changed our board policy so that all foods offered at all school related events except for those where the parents would be present they have to be selected from this district wide pre-approved food list. So this would be before school and after school and during school. So even our Girl Scout groups that come and have um, their, um, their sessions here in the buildings after school, they have to follow that. So anytime there's a group of kids here without their parents, all of those foods have to be from the pre-approved food list. We modify the list on a regular basis three times a year with that committee to make sure that it stays current for the students. Next slide, please. So I really think that, um, that you know, when we look at these um, items that can make a big difference in, this, in, the, in the schools for kids, I felt that um, really embracing these different groups, trying to bring as many people to the table as possible to make the decisions has, um, has made a big difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. That was um, really a great presentation. Um, I love that your school district is looking at SEL. I know that that's a big buzzword right now in schools. And um, unless you're kind of in the know, you don't necessarily know what that means. Um, so I think it's great that you guys are touching on SEL. Um, and I really am intrigued by your, um, your work behind getting the food changed at uh, schools for various celebrations. I know that that can be a hard thing to do. It's part of the school culture. So kudos to you for making those changes um, in your district. Um, okay, so we are going to pass this along to Carla Smith. Uh, Carla is rolling off of um, a big day yesterday in New Hampshire. As you know, it was the primary, so very exciting for that state. Um, Carla is with the Ellis School in Fremont, New Hampshire, and um, will be sharing some information around um, keeping kids safe, specifically around utilizing EpiPens. Take it away, Carla. 
Hello, everybody. And I want to as well thank Sandy for an excellent presentation. And I hope I keep you all just as interested as she did me. I know I made many notes myself and look forward into exploring a little bit more on those employee wellness activities. Sandy, I think those were fantastic ideas. So my name is Carla Smith. I am a registered nurse in Fremont, New Hampshire. I've been a nurse now for a little bit over 15 years. Um, I've been in the school nurse setting for about five. Um, previous to that, my background is critical care, specifically emergency nursing. I was a certified emergency nurse, um, kind of brought extensive safety type knowledge into the school setting. Um, very different climate and way of your assessment skills, but it has been, it, it's been a fantastic transition and I've really enjoyed it here. So a little bit about my school. We are in a very rural area, as you can see by my map. New Hampshire is just kind of a small little state up in the corner. But more importantly, I live in a very small town in um, New Hampshire. We have a population of about 2,500 people. My building is about 430 students, 80 staff members. So we're roughly 500 people on a daily basis. That's a very small, and we're a single school district. Um, we are preschool through eighth grade. We do not have a high school in our town. We actually tuition our students elsewhere for that. We don't have any health services in town. I don't have a hospital. I don't have a health clinic. Don't have a single doctor with a shingle out on his house saying, you know, come see me here. There's no dental care. So we really have to rely on outside communities to meet the wellness needs of, of our small rural community. Um, we are kind of very fortunate in the aspect that we're centrally located to about five different hospitals, anywhere within a 20 to 30 minute um, range from where we are. One of the tricky things that I've encountered here is we also don't have EMS services. So if I have an EMS call placed, I know I'm really running the show until they arrive. And response time can be anywhere from 8 to 20 minutes. In an emergency, it seems more like 8 to 20 hours. It's, it, it can be pretty overwhelming, and that does happen. So again, that's where you just really have to jump in and do what you can to enhance the safety um, for, for your students or your staff until they arrive. One of the other great advantages I have about working at the Ellis School in Fremont is I also I live in Fremont. Um, it's really a great small little community. I've had three children um, attend the school where I work. I currently my youngest daughter is still with me. She's ten years old and in the fifth grade. It's allowed me to really bring kind of a true community partnership together. Um, I work with multiple agencies in town. I am also our town's deputy health officer for Fremont. Um, I work closely with our fire and our police organizations. Um, I work very closely with our PTA. And it's really, I think, enhanced my school nursing practice that I am kind of have that opportunity to do these things within our small community. Next slide, please. Two things I'm going to discuss today. Um, I was one of the recipients of the 2015 School Leader Leadership Award. And I was asked today, I'm going to discuss two different programs that I have run here at my school. The first one is how um, I established EpiPen training for our staff. And the second is a wellness program that I do with my students um, called our Halloween Candy Buyback Program. I'll go to the next slide, please. So one of the things I discovered um, as a new school nurse um, back in 2010 was that I didn't have a whole lot in way of EpiPen training. I said, hey, when do I get to teach, the, when do I do the training for this? And I kind of got looked at by administration saying, oh, well, you can talk at a staff meeting. OK, um, that, that really wasn't a good, a good way to approach this. We're talking, it was a non-mandatory staff meeting. I was given maybe five minutes to do a demonstration, not even so much a teaching for EpiPen training. In 2012, I had three separate EMS calls for anaphylaxis that year. Like I said before, our EMS response time is 8 to 20 minutes. Those were documented times. Fortunately for us, um, all three of these incidents, students had prescribed EpiPens for known allergies. And they were older students. These were my 7th and 8th graders that these incidents happened with. They were 12 to 13 years old. And they approached me in the nursing office, walked themselves to the nursing office, and said, I think I'm having an allergic reaction. They were very aware and of their own symptoms and what was going on. Another thing that I had noticed is the increase in the amount of students with prescribed EpiPens. I was getting between five and seven new kindergarten students each year 
with diagnosed allergies, and I was graduating out anywhere from zero to one in the eighth grade to the high school. So the percentage of EpiPens in my office went from, I used to have five, I think this current year I have 19 in my office. For a very small school, that's a huge percentage. The other thing, and I'm, again, I'm going back to this timing period here, right around 2012, that our school stock EpiPens, we had one of each. We had one EpiPen and we had one EpiPen Junior on hand. Twin packs were not made available, they were not budgeted for, um, and we just didn't have access to them. Next slide, please. So one of the things I decided was that I needed to somehow advocate for this change, saying, hey, like, we, we need to be doing better with this. I'm a very vocal person. I spoke at school board meetings. I stood up and spoke at our town deliberative sessions. I've been to PTA meetings. I had gone to staff meetings. I, I created a monthly report from the nurse's office, sent that off to administration, and things really weren't changing. Um, and I included, I did a lot of research. We did the resources from the American Academy of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology. We looked at Anaphylaxis Canada, allergyready.com, and their, their care program. That was a staff training tool. Um, foodallergy.org, or the FAIR program. Um, Safe at School Food Allergy Guidelines. School Nurse Association. And still, again, I, I, I kept facing opposition because no one really knew what to do, even though I was giving suggestions. Next slide, please. So the one thing I decided for myself was, OK, if, if they're not going to listen to a nurse, they're going to listen to another educator. So that's what I did. I went back to school. I completed my MSN in nursing education. And at that point now, I was a peer. And I could talk the language of an educator. Because I have discovered that they, it, you have a very high response when you speak the language of an educator versus when you speak the language of nursing. Again, being in a single school district, I, I, don't have, I don't have any other nurses in my district to collaborate with. There's no one at a school down the road or over, you know, across the parking lot, another building. It, it was really just me. So I kind of figured if I join them, this is going to work. And it was fantastic. Um, I used this as a platform for my nursing capstone, and I decided to do a research project. And what I did was I used our grading rubric. We are a district that is kind of one of the stepping stone districts for using competency-based grading. So we don't assign letter grades in our, in our district. We use a rubric that determines if somebody is exceeding expectations, meeting expectations, or below. So what I did was I used the exact rubric that our teachers used for their students to assess their skills in anaphylaxis. Next slide, please. And I focused this on not just certified teachers in the building, but I did all of our support staff, which would include our paraeducators, our secretaries, our janitor um, staff, our kitchen staff, um, along with our administration. Like, I roped my principal and my assistant principal and my superintendent into this, and I said, you, you need to do this as well. And I really had a decent response from all of them. Everyone was very excited about it. So the little, the lengthy, name of the research project was the assessment of teachers, administrators, and support staff's knowledge and the ability to identify and manage anaphylactic reactions in the elementary and the middle school settings. I did this as a two-part research method. It was quantitative, so we collected the data. Part one was a survey, um, and we used knowledge base to identify a reaction. We provided the objective percentage score that was using the rubric, and they, it was determined that 80% or higher meant that they met the expectations and lower than that they did not. Part two was a practical assessment, um, and it measured their ability to manage. We used the direction straight from an EpiPen demo pen and packaging insert, which is the four steps of your EpiPen administration. It was an objective pass-fail scoring. Next slide, please. So these are my results, and this was where it was pretty enlightening. 31% of the staff members who participated met expectations. That means that 69% did not. Um, we used standardized questions that came from the Safe at School and Ready to Learn programs and how to care for students with food allergies. These were unbiased questions, and it was all about how to identify anaphylaxis. And it's pretty scary to know that two-thirds of the staff in this building were not able to recognize 
that their student might be having a reaction. Next slide, please. The next part was how to demonstrate an EpiPen. 7%, which actually went, equated to one participant, could accurately administer an EpiPen. This is the part that I think scared us all the most. That you gave them the tools, they have the pen in front of them, they received that quick five-minute demonstration, but yet they could not accurately administer an EpiPen in the event of an emergency. So this was the big eye-opener to my district that, oh my god, oh my god, we need to do something. Next slide, please. So this is where I'm going to talk about how I feel success is a very, very beautiful thing. Because of this research project that I did, because I put it in front of them as an educator, and I put it in a language that they understood, our district has changed. We now have a full hour of mandatory training at the start of every school year during professional development time, and we teach EpiPen training. And this is a full teaching of these are the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. This is what you need to look for in your students. This is how it can, this is how it can present. This is how you use a pen. And more importantly, everybody has the chance to demonstrate to me how to use the pen back. So I can fully view and comprehend how, our, how my staff members are doing with this and that they understand the training. We are also now allowed, um, allotted four hours of CPR, first aid, and AED training every two years. Prior to this, um, there wasn't CPR training offered even though I am a certified instructor. So it's very exciting now to say I can teach a class of staff members every two years where before I was not given that opportunity to do so. The other thing I've been able to implement is that the lead teacher or the staff member for all of our field trips now must demonstrate proper EpiPen administration to me prior to the field trip. And if they can't do that, that's okay. I provide them with re-encouragement and I say, you're going to sit down with me and let's go through this again. And I provide one-on-one -on -one training with them to make certain that they are comfortable taking an EpiPen with them on a field trip. We secured our budget. Instead of having one of each pen, I now have twin packs available. As we all know, that is the current practice. Evidence base has showed us that rebound reactions do occur, and they occur very often um, before EMS arrives. And also the importance of having school stock um, epinephrine on hand in the event a first-time reaction occurs. I have two incidents here that I can relate to in the past year that really showed that these changes have been um, effective in our district. The first one, I did have a staff member last year um, who had a, no prior history of, an of any type of allergies or reactions who had an acute onset of anaphylaxis. She understood immediately that something was wrong and she sought help with me and actually required two full epinephrine doses before EMS arrived. That was one of our 20-minute calls before um, response times on that event. Another event that happened it was a much younger student. I had an eight-year-old student who actually, he does have a history of a peanut allergy, who returned from lunch and recess with an onset of kind of a dry cough, more of one of those ticks where they're just trying to clear their throat. And he had some developing hives going on, some urticaria. And the teacher's like, are you OK? And at first, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm fine. I was just playing out on the field at recess. And the teacher knew and was watching him and said, nope, something isn't right. Brought the student to me. And lo and behold, he was having an anaphylactic reaction. Her immediate attention of recognizing something is not right with my student. The student was denying that he was having trouble breathing. He's like, oh, no, I feel fine. I feel fine. But she knew better, and she brought him to me. This student got an EpiPen, EMS was called, the parents were called, and this student ended up making out just fine. Um, and it's just, it's enlightening to know that a staff member was able to step in without having to wait for a student to be able to say, I'm not feeling very well. We can go to the next slide, please. The one thing that I did learn with this, which was fantastic, is as I was securing this budgeting, we've also been very fortunate now to partner um, with a local urgent care center a few towns over who signs our prescriptions for us, so we are able to utilize the free EpiPen for School program that's offered by Mylar Pharmaceuticals. This is um, a program that is available nationwide, and if it's something, if anybody is not utilizing this yes, yet in their district, I highly, highly suggest that you look into the resource for this. Um, it, it's fantastic, and they will provide annually to your school, and they'll provide them to every building in your school. So if you're a multi-school district, they will ensure that you have free EpiPens available in every building. 
So the next program, um, jumping ahead here, that I'm going to talk about is our Halloween candy buyback. This is an annual event. It promotes healthy choices in oral health um, in, our t in our town. Um, this is kind of an idea I had as a parent one time. Um, kind of like, what do I do with all of my extra Halloween candy? I've got a whole bowl of it on my kitchen table. Back in the day, I used to take it to me to the emergency room. It was fantastic to have in the emergency room because if it was a busy shift, that, that's really the only thing you probably ate all day long. I didn't feel as a good role model as a school nurse to be kind of bringing it in and leaving it there. So what do I do with all this? Also, what can I do to support education? So we developed this program. Essentially, what we do is we tell our kids, go trick-or-treating, have a great time, keep your favorites and trade in the rest of your candy and get a healthy treat bag instead. What we do is we collect all the candy and we donate it to military troops that are serving overseas so that they know that their candy is going to a good place, they feel good stewardship and passing it along. And in five years now, we just had our fifth event this past October, we've collected over 1,800 pounds of candy. We actually do weigh and collect all of the candy that's part of the fun for the kids. You can see in the, the picture here in the top um, right corner, that's the kids getting their candy and having it weighed as they're passing it in. It becomes highly competitive. It's a lot of fun. Um, and what we do is we partner with a local nonprofit during the month of, of October and November, um, and they provide um, our oral health classroom education for grades K to 6. This was a program that was already in existence, but it kind of was scattered all over the school year as to when it actually happened. So by bringing them in and asking them, like, hey, can we do this at the same time, it's become a fantastic partnership. Next slide, please. So the other thing that's nice with that is um, Lamprey Healthcare is the ones who provide our dental education. We're able to provide toothbrushes, toothpaste, and floss to every student that's getting this oral health education at the same time. Um, so what we do is when the kids turn in their candy, I give them a healthy treat bag. The bags to always include the toothbrush, the toothpaste, and the floss. It includes a fresh apple. We get water bottles. We've had stickers, pencils, all sorts of fun prizes. And I mean, they're all. Some of them are like birthday party trinket prizes. Some of them are a little bit more elaborate, depending on who the sponsor is that year and what they've donated. Um, one of the biggest things we had one year was those foam stress balls. That that was a big highlight. Um, this past year, we had little paper airplanes, um, that little flyer airplanes. That was a big deal that we had there. Sponsorships, local dentists, um, our apple orchard down the road called them. They were more than happy to participate. All sorts of small businesses, as well as some national corporations um, and sports teams. It's really all about who you reach out to and how you can achieve this to get it done. How do I do it? And I, I, I have the little smiley icon there. It's really a lot of lobbying. You're making phone calls, you're sending emails, you're knocking on the doors of local businesses or talking with them as you're there doing your own shopping, talking to parents. Where do the, what companies do these parents work for? What are they able to offer? Um, a lot of work with our PTA with that. Making different connections at conventions and workshops. Um, pretty much everywhere I go, I am always on the radar for free giveaways that I can use in our candy buyback. I went to our state. Um, immunization conference one year and Department of Health and Human Services was there with this whole array of colored rainbow pencils about vaccination and I started talking with them and she's like oh my gosh here like take all of these back to your school with you okay I put that in my pile of my supplies for the next year um, all different places I go there's and pretty much one of these things is when you have this type of passion and this type of program in place that You've got a health component, you've got an education component, you've got a we're supporting the soldiers component. I, I've really never encountered anybody who said no. Everybody has really jumped on board with this program and been very supportive of this. And all of this has been done with zero budget. Um, there is nothing built into our school budget for this whatsoever. It is all 100% donation supported. Next slide, please. So a couple other things that really helped um, generate the success of this we utilize social media. Our school itself has a Facebook page, so the school it went out through the school site. It also went out through the town's PTA site. The, um, the teachers' union has a site, so we kind of spread the word as much as we can. 
advertising in the local newspapers about this. Um, we were actually a feature article in the state um, union leader a few years back. They were talking about Halloween and different programs, and we were a feature article in the Sunday news section, which that was kind of a big deal. We use the, t the town and the school websites. We use letters. I always invite the local daycares to participate. Again, this is a small town. We have three small local daycares, and we have one from a neighboring town. And they bring their students in to participate. And it's fantastic, because it's teaching them at such a young age of alternatives that they can have to eating all of this candy and sugar and having it in their diet. I've also invited local veterans to participate. Um, we had one year where the veterans themselves collected the candy from the students in the lobby um, and weighed the candy. And the kids really enjoyed that because they kind of had the sense of who they were sending their candy to um, to see where it was ending up. Another thing to generate age, um, interest is we do those daily Facebook updates. So you know, on day one, we collected X amount of candy. On day two, we collected. X amount of candy. Um, one of my favorite pictures is the picture in the very center of this um, slide here. It says 520 and a half. We collected 520 and a half pounds of candy. We had to include the half because the little girl was just too cute to pass up to put in that photo op there. But these are the types of things. And this here is actually a picture of the thank you card that I sent out to all of my sponsors that year. So I think it's very important that you share pictures of your event and the excitement of your event with these sponsors and they see what, wow, what a great impact I made um, in this community. The other thing is really you need to enlist help. We've enlisted help from our PTA and help from our student council. Our student council really, they weigh all the candy for the kids. They keep track. They have a spreadsheet of all, everybody's homerooms and they really make an event of it. It's fantastic. PTA moms, we, we've been at the school up until 10 o'clock at night sometimes, stuffing all these bags and getting them prepared for the kids. But it's really been a fantastic event in our community. Um, and, and just, you know, the participation level has been fantastic. Next slide, please. So a few of my takeaway points, um, lessons learned along the way. There's just so many things that I have discovered that we can do that kind of bridge together nursing and, and education. As school nurses, sometimes we are the only ones. We kind of feel like we're on our own island. Um, but by really working together, there's so many things that we can do um, to enhance the building. And there's no idea that that's too small or too big to go forward with. And it's kind of overwhelming sometimes. Um, there's so many things I want to do. I want to work with my employees, and I want to you know, enhance the safety, and I want to work on this wellness piece and on this physical education piece. And, the best thing advice I can give is that pick one small topic that you're really passionate about and just really see how far it goes. Uh, and it's pretty incredible how many other people will feel that same way and feel your passion and step up and to help you. The other thing that I've learned, um, advocacy is not an easy, it's not easy. It's not always popular and it can be very fatiguing and I really put that in there because the whole EpiPen issue, I felt like I was a broken record on and on. And no matter how many times I said it, it was never the top priority of the district. And, and I don't really mean that in a negative way. I, they've got all sorts of things. They have to worry about improving the math scores. And you know, have we done enough professional development on our new reading program? And do we need to this? So an EpiPen issue is not always front and center. So it's fatiguing. But persistence does pay off. And don't ever give up. Just keep putting it out there. And when it's not being receptive to the way that it is out there, find another way to present it. And you will find something that works. And just don't ever give up. Um, and also, always celebrate your accomplishments in your profession. We are nurses. And I always take every opportunity I can to celebrate that I am a nurse. I am licensed by the Board of Nursing. This is my profession, this is my training, and this is what I'm going to do to help enhance your educational environment and be a part of it. Um, and and it, it's, been, it's just been fantastic. So I thank you very, very much for allowing me to participate in this conference today. Um, anybody, feel free. You can reach out to me with any questions that you have. I, I love to participate in all sorts of different boards and discussions and blogs and and just, I always love to help pay it forward to other school nurses as well if there's anything I can do. So thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. That was a great presentation. Um, 
definitely persistent pays, and you uh, showed that through all your hard work. So, um, and I really love the candy buyback program, and that you're weighing the candy. Um, that's so impactful for kids. They they can kind of wrap their heads around that versus just you know handing off their candy and trading it for apples. So kudos to you and um, all your hard work. So we're going to uh, open up our webinar to or open up the opportunity for um, our attendees to ask questions of our school nurses. And Alex is going to um, lead the question and answer section uh, portion for us. So um, I'll hand this off to Alex. Great, thanks so much, Christy. Um, and thank you to Sandy and Carla for fantastic presentations. I learned so much and was writing down lots of notes as well. Um, we really appreciate you sharing all that great information. Um, for everybody who's on the phone, please feel free to send in questions for um, Carla and Sandy. We'll have about 10 minutes to do our Q&A. Um, so keep on sending those in. And I will just go ahead and get started. Um, so the first is for Sandy. Um, Sandy, you provided a great list of programming that you use for your staff wellness um, initiative, and somebody wanted to know um, how you identified those, those programs and how you kind of built that list of um, ways to you know, build up your, your staff wellness program. Um, most of it came from looking at the, the school health index that I referenced. Um, if you look at that, if you look at that tool that's um, on the CDC website, um, they have it all broken down. So there is actually, do you have a this? And you circle that. Do you have a that? And so it's a, basically a rubric for what you currently have and then based on what they consider standard of practice, what they feel like you need. So I really use that as the foundation, so that CDC um, site to look at your school health index. And then also that other reference that I gave you, um, that school employee wellness site, um, it's, it's a very large booklet um, that has a, a lot of toolboxes and, again, ways to look at your current practice and what maybe some of your areas of weakness are to be able to pinpoint it. That's where I started to be able to kind of see which direction to go. That's great. And a follow-up question to that is, how did you motivate staff to join the wellness committee? Yeah, you know, that was, it was interesting. It's grown each year. So at the very beginning, uh, there were probably only six of us. And we kind of took that and um, just kind of started with different activities, started with things that people wanted. They wanted, the, uh, the staff wanted things that were easy. They wanted to be here in the building for me to do. So if we first started with things that they wanted, like a yoga class. And so I found somebody that would come here and teach yoga. Then they were kind of heard, and it was something that they asked for, and they realized that we could provide this. And then the more people were like, well, could we have a walking program? Could we have a, as the more of those came up, and hey, why don't you join the committee? Sure, we can do that. Come and join us, and we'll get that in place. So I had people starting to email me with their thoughts. And as they did that, and as that kind of enthusiasm that we could change this environment ourselves kind of caught on, I just kept inviting them to come to the table as opposed to them giving it to me to do. Like, yeah, why don't you come and we can all generate this together. Um, so that was kind of how I started to get that committee to go. That's great. Thank you. Um, so the next question is for Carla. Carla, somebody wants to know if you ran into any union issues with your programming, um, specifically around requiring staff to provide a return EpiPen demonstration. Is that, did you encounter any union issues? I did not for that. I mean, you have your Good Samaritan laws that are going to protect anybody if they're going to administer an EpiPen or not. What we did was it was a mandatory staff meeting, so pretty much, it, it made sure that everybody was in attendance. Everybody had to demonstrate an EpiPen and return the use. Now, as an educator, you are not obligated to administer an EpiPen if you are not feeling comfortable in doing so. But when we do have field trips, there does need to be one person. If there is a student on this trip that has a prescribed EpiPen, somebody has to take over the pen and go with them. We do not have budgeting in place. We do not have nurse substitutes available to attend field trips. So you have to make certain, especially if somebody's on a 504 for an EpiPen, that there is an EpiPen trained individual. Um, so I've actually I, I've been, received nothing but great support from my union. Um, and typically, if it's in the school building, I'm the one that's going to be administering the pen if it happens here. This was more to make certain that everybody had the knowledge 
um, to give a pen in the, event, in the event of an emergency, but also most importantly that they could recognize the signs and symptoms that a student was in trouble. And we all know there are some people that just, there are people who respond to medical emergencies and there are people who stay on the sidelines. And I encourage my staff to say it is okay to stay on the sidelines if you are not comfortable, but you do need to recognize when someone needs help and you do need to recognize when 911 needs to be called. Great, thank you. And a follow-up question to that is somebody wanting to know if you bring EpiPens on all field trips, even if there's not an EpiPen prescribed for a student. We do not. Um, we do the only in-house EpiPens we have stay in-house, um, and part of this is our state law as well. So, as we know, EpiPen laws do vary state to state. It is no nationwide standard. In the state of New Hampshire, only an RN is allowed to possess and carry and administer an unprescribed EpiPen. So I could not send a pen on a field trip with a teacher for an event a reaction occurs because by state law they are not allowed to administer it. Only an RN can do that. Okay, great. Thanks. That's really helpful. Um, another question for Sandy wanting to know about funding. I think she anticipated this one would come. Um, just wanting to know how you know, you've implemented this really robust wellness program. Um, is it all just through free resources or do you have any funding to support the program? So through our employee benefits program, um, we get, it, it, we're part of a, a big conglomeration of districts that come together to provide benefits for our uh, employees. And through that, they have, we get money back as a district for the number of participants we have in our wellness screen because the research has supported that if you go to a wellness screen, that you'll more likely identify early on some things that you need to be dealing with with your health. So decreasing money on the business side at the long end, if we get staff in to see that they're pre-diabetic or that their cholesterol is higher or whatever kind of concerns they might find from this blood screen. So the more participants we get in the, the wellness screen, the more money we get back. So the money that we use for our wellness program is from that money that comes back to the district um, to support our employee benefits. So since we're the ones that promote it and put it all together, those dollars we get to use to, um, to do this program. Though much of what we did do on our breakouts um, was really um, people donated that time. But our speaker, when we first brought our speaker in, we did need to pay for him, so those, those costs. Um, we do give our, our um, staff members raffle prizes. Everybody gets a raffle ticket to participate in the wellness screen, and we do give um, some pretty fun raffle prizes, again, to get them into the door. Really, it's only to benefit them by getting good blood information about themselves, but since we do get that kickback of, of money, we use that, that funding. Great, thank you. Um, and one quick follow-up is um, people want to know if you can possibly provide a copy of the survey that you use for your employee wellness, and that's something if you are able to share, we can find a way to get it out to everybody. Yes, I can do that. It's it's um it's available electronically. It, and it wasn't Perfect. ours. It's another. So that's easy enough to do. I'll send it to you. Wonderful. So for people on the uh, participating, we'll be sure to send out a link to that survey that Sandy used to kickstart her program. Um, great. So a question for both of you. Um, I think, and this will probably be our last question is just um, wanting to know kind of what was the biggest challenge you faced in your program um, and how you overcame it. We've had a couple people comment just on how they really run into, especially on the, the school food side, you know, run into mis misperceptions about healthy food not being important or um, that healthy food shouldn't be served in schools. Um, and I think for both of you, you've done an incredible job of implementing programs that would likely encounter some resistance. And so I'd love to hear you know, what you felt like the biggest challenge was in the program that you implemented and how you overcame that. Um, I think I can answer on that. So one of the things, like I said, I found the biggest thing was people don't understand nursing. You can throw health statistics at them. You can throw all sorts of criteria. You can use evidence-based practice. You can have journal articles. And you have to find a way to speak in the language that people understand. So with my EpiPen program, it was speaking to teachers using teaching rubrics. Um, when it comes to health initiatives, when it comes to health incentives for this type of program for the Halloween candy buyback, it was really speaking at the parent level. 
And it was about finding a balance. It was not taking something away from the children. Like, we didn't want to go out there and say, oh, we want to ban trick-or-treat in our area, or we, we want to start handing out prizes instead of candy, because we knew that there would be resistance with that. So it was about finding a balance to say, hey, OK, we acknowledge it. Halloween is part of childhood. We understand you're going to get candy. Why don't you keep a handful of pieces that are your favorite and do something good with the rest and do it for a healthy cause? So I think it was about finding that balance and just really speaking the language of to your audience um, in a way that they understand, in a way that they find supportive. Great, thank you. And Sandy, do you have any thoughts on that question? You know, I agree with that. I, I think you know, even when you look at our, our pre-approved food list, it was really having both sides of the concern at the table, having everybody have a voice, and again, like you said, not taking anything away. We're not, you know, going to change the world, we, but we do need, you do need to recognize how many kids have an issue, and I think, you know, really providing some of that documentation to these parents that don't have allergic kids who just don't see that. We always did when I was a kid, you know, to kind of get over that, you know, argument that's really not an argument anymore. Um, really getting everybody at the table and again just finding that balance of providing healthy options, providing safe options, but not getting rid of it completely and really working together to find a compromise. And as long as you people realize that we're trying to make a compromise, not take everything away, I, I do think that that kind of got you in the door. Great, thank you. I think that is incredible advice to share with everybody and a great note to end on. Um, so thank you once again to Sandy and Carla for joining us today and for the wonderful work that you're leading. Um, just one more plug for our annual School Nurse Leadership Award. Um, here is the link to download the application. Um, and as Christy shared, we will be sending out an email um, within the week with a link to listen to the recording of this webinar um, and access um, both Carla and Sandy's slides. Um, so thank you, everybody, um, and enjoy the rest of your days. Um, and thank you once again to Sandy and Carla.